you're not of a Christian persuasion, yeah. it's obviously very hard to just take the text of the Bible and go, that's evidence Jesus was around and his claims are true. What have we got historically in terms of texts that can, you know, talk about Jesus in uh, like a weighty manner where they don't just write it off as, well, yeah, you're biased because you believe the Bible to begin with? The weight of historical evidence for Jesus of Nazareth is greater than any other historical figure that's out there. So if we write off Jesus of Nazareth, we've got to write off all of history because the wealth of evidence um, truly is overwhelming from both uh, the New Testament documents, which we've got 27 New Testament documents. Then you've got all of these documents from uh, Roman writers, Jewish writers, Greek writers, authors. Um, outside of the New Testament and when you put them all together it paints such a vivid picture of Jesus of Nazareth as he is described in the New Testament documents and so modern day historians actually agree on quite a lot uh, and this includes atheist New Testament historians they agree that Jesus existed that he was a preacher from the Galilee that he had a huge following of disciples that included women which was very unusual for a first century Jewish rabbi that he was known as a miracle worker and an exorcist. And they don't agree that he did these things, but he was known as that. Right. Um, that he was tried by Pontius Pilate, who they agree, again, was a, a true historical figure. He was crucified uh, by the Romans. Uh, that he was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, his tomb was discovered empty by a group of female followers. Historians agree on that. And that's no small feat because people were afraid of the yeah. Romans and their terrible punishments. And wasn't there a guard outside? So, you know, it couldn't have been a sneaky, steal the body kind of situation because it would have meant death for all those involved. Sure. And there's absolutely no motivation to steal a body from a Jewish perspective. And these were Jewish disciples, Jewish fishermen, Jewish tax collectors. They knew what the Roman law was for stealing a body. And to do so on the Sabbath day as well, which was against Jewish custom, if you broke the Sabbath, you could face the death penalty for doing such a thing, like removing a body from, from a tomb. And so there's absolutely no motivation on their behalf, on their side, to do such a thing. So the fact that there is an empty tomb um, and the disciples very, very early on, straight out of the gate, they are recording the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that more than 500 eyewitnesses saw him. They saw the resurrected Jesus and he offered them many convincing proofs that he's alive. So even atheist historians have come to the conclusion that his disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus alive after his death. But they try and explain these post-mortem appearances away by things like hallucination or, you know, but these are like really outlandish I would say they're more outlandish than actually believing in the resurrection itself, to think that more than 500 people had an hallucination of the resurrected Jesus. Um, Can I ask, did any sure. of those 500 people um, make record of what they saw? Is that part of the text that we can talk about? And so, well, you've got the writings in the New Testament of the disciples. So one of the strongest arguments is the Apostle Paul himself. He was a Pharisee. He was anti-Christian, anti-Jesus. Because it's went, important to note that Jews didn't necessarily believe that Jesus was their Messiah. So Jews didn't have a vested interest in promoting Jesus, did they? And no. that's where Paul was coming from, right? Very much so. And in the first century, Jewish people did not have a concept of a dying Messiah who had come to die for their sins. What they wanted was a Messiah like King David who was going to come along. Kick the Romans out. Kick the Romans out, <laughs> overthrow the Roman Empire and fulfill the prophecy of Daniel that the the stone joined the fourth world empire would come and smash the, the statue on its feet and the four Gentile empires uh, would come crumbling down and then God would establish this new Jewish empire, this new Jewish kingdom. So they were looking for a Messiah that was going to do that for them. They were not looking for a crucified Messiah who was coming to die for the sins of the world. That was completely outside of their frame of reference. So to suddenly go from being... Like with Paul, for instance, being somebody who wanted to wipe Christianity off of the map, he was arresting Christians, putting them, uh, sending them to Sanhedrin, putting them on trial. Stephen, we know, was stoned to death and he was celebrating. Paul was holding the coats of the sure. people that were throwing the stones, yeah. For him to then suddenly change from that perspective to being one of the most ardent pursuers of Jesus and a disciple of Jesus 
is, is, you know, what caused that if not the resurrection of Jesus? What would suddenly transform a Jewish Pharisee who hated the Christian faith into and, being its promoter? And so one of the appearances of Jesus, when we talk about the 500 people who actually saw him post-resurrection, Paul was one of those. Jesus Paul's appeared to words. him. He yeah. says, he appeared to me. Absolutely right. And Paul saw the resurrected Jesus, as did the 12 uh, apostles, as did more than 500 eyewitnesses Paul mentions in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. And that testimony in 1 Corinthians, speaking about uh, what was passed on to Paul, that Jesus appeared first of all to, like, obviously to the women, then he appeared to, to Cephas and the other disciples, he appeared to James, then last of all he appeared to Paul. Paul mentions there about 500 eyewitnesses who saw him. And when Jesus rose again, he didn't appear at a long kind of far away distance he appeared right in front of them so that they could touch him they ate with him they spoke with him thomas put his fingers into the nail marks and into the spear wound so things were not done in a secretive way this was done in broad daylight if you like and jesus remained on the earth for a period of 40 days where he was constantly appearing to people and showing convincing proofs and then when he did ascend to heaven he didn't do it out in the backwoods somewhere. He did it from the Mount of Olives. And if you look at where the Mount of Olives is in comparison to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, it's literally just over the valley. So many, many people would have seen this ascension of Jesus too. Things were not done in a dark corner. I think, because you mentioned the 12 apostles, so they spent a, a good section of their life with Jesus when he was alive on the earth before his death his crucifixion and resurrection. And then they went on, some of those apostles, to write these New Testament books that we have, which historians generally verify as these are valid historical documents. So the fact that these men witnessed that resurrection and then wrote about it, and historians say we can verify this as a good account of history, I think that kind of gives it weight as well. Mm. Because what I like about the Bible um, unlike some other religious texts, is it's not just a book of this is what you have to do, these are the rules to appease God. It's actually a historical account of the life of Jesus and what happened. And then it's verified by texts outside of Christianity yeah. in terms of its timeline of events and what happened. So it's not just somebody who claims, oh, I'm a prophet and, you know, I've had a download and here, here are the rules you must follow. Atheist historians actually validate that the, the historical text that's contained within the Bible is valid. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, the atheist historians now, they are saying that there were post-mortem appearances of Jesus. Like Gerd Ludman, who was uh, one of the most famous New Testament historians, said that it's, it's undoubtable that there were post-mortem appearances of Jesus alive. Atheists are saying this. I mean, the historical evidence for the existence of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, very, very strong. And as you mentioned earlier, what you know, what other motivation would the disciples have had to fake a resurrection? I mean, just they were putting their lives on the line doing this. And within the context of first century Judaism, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no reason for them to do this. But as you mentioned, outside of the New Testament, outside of the 27 documents of the New Testament, there are many, many people who write about uh, Jesus. Tacitus, um, very early on, um, writes this about... So he was a Roman historian. So. Yeah. So not necessarily a Christian. He's not, he's not a Christian at all. He was looking for ways to punish the Christians. And um, Tacitus writes this. He says, consequently, to get rid of the report, this is the report of the burning of, of Rome, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, who is a name for Christ, Jesus here, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for a moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. So just in this little quote, he's talking about Christians being tortured for their faith. It's a mischievous superstition to the Romans that Christ um, was, uh, he suffered the extreme penalty, which would have been crucifixion in the Roman world at the hands of one of their procurators during the reign of Tiberius, 
um, and the procreator, of course, was uh, Pontius Pilate, and how it broke out in Judea and then spread all over the Roman world and even found its home in Rome. I mean, this is incredible information. It's Tiberius. That's mentioned in the Gospels Tiberius too. Tiberius Caesar, right? Yeah. That was the Caesar he was... of Jesus' time. So yeah. it confirms everything the Gospel authors are saying. And we've got many, many other writers that we could kind of uh, look at. Pliny the Younger, for instance, he writes that Christians used to meet on a certain fixed day before it was light and when they had sung an alternate verse, a, a hymn to Christ as to a God, they bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do wicked deeds, never to commit fraud, theft or adultery, and not to lie or to deny a trust. So here he's talking about these early Christians getting together before sunrise and they're worshipping Jesus as God. So right out of the gate, um, you know, Christianity didn't develop a theology of Jesus. Uh, that, that he became a god later on in church history. No, no, he, right out of the gate, he was considered god, god in the flesh, and they worshipped him as such. Mm -hmm. And both the 27 documents of the New Testament record that, and extra biblical sources record this also. Well, Jesus himself, like what you're saying, it wasn't a, a post-historical thing where, is it canonized? Is that the right word? Where they canonize saints or something? Okay. Jesus yeah, made the claim saying. himself. This is who I am and followed it right through. He fulfilled prophecies about himself and then his followers whom he met and showed them the way of life and who witnessed the death and the resurrection. They then were martyred for their faith. They held to it. And like we're saying, uh, the Apostle Paul, who was anti-Christian, he was a Roman um, he converted because he had this encounter with Jesus. So, you know, these are people that were willing to put their life on the line. Yeah, incredible, absolutely incredible testimony. And um, we could talk a lot more about this, but we're going to cut the program short here and uh, we'll come back on another week. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul.